All right, I am with the Kennesaw State Autonomous Race Team. We've got Ben and we've got Tim. Uh, tell me about your cart. You know, this is a driverless autonomous cart. It goes around the track without any input. It's completely independent. Uh, so how do you guys do that? How does it work? So first we start with our normal drivetrain, our mandated drivetrain, which is using the high school race um, standard of the ME0708, I think, an all tracks controller. Uh, essentially the drivetrain from a golf cart. Um, then built on top of that, everything else is ours. Everything from the steering, which is in our second, or th it's pretty much in our third iteration. Uh, we had to make sure that it was solid and uh, as well as our braking, that is completely ours. So we have a dynamic brake and emergency brake. Uh, our emergency brake is a fail-safe electromagnet with our dynamic brake being uh, a torque-controlled motor, which is a VLDC. So when it comes to the low-level system, everything is uh, controlled by, or at least the actuators are controlled by a single system called the O-Drive, which is a motor controller. And that is able to control both our braking and steering at the same time. Uh, so going up a level from that, which is our embedded platform, which is using a Teensy. Uh, from that, we communicate to it with a radio. So essentially, you can take off everything above the Teensy and you can run it RC. Everything else is the autonomous layer. So from the Teensy level, uh, when it's in autonomous mode, we are able to either kill it or let it run. When we kill it, it kills our e-brake and kills power, or turns off the key switch on the motor controller. And that allows us to be fail-safe. We also have, um, importantly, our secondary fail-safe system, which allows us, which is a completely uh, electrically separate uh, system that can kill our cart in the same fashion. So building up on top of that, we have our central controls, which is being done by our PC. So our PC is an i7-9700 with in, on top of a uh, embedded motherboard, essentially, and we are uh, able to power that off of a single 24 volt uh, power supply. And from that, we get all of our sensor input from our Villadyne and our IMU and our RTK GPS. So, of course, uh, anyone knowing autonomous sensors would know what this is, but for anyone that doesn't, this is a... Uh, this is a LiDAR. So, laser a LiDAR imaging, sensor. distancing, and ranging sensor. So, we're able to get a lot of laser points in a 3D cloud, essentially. So, you perfect. See, you can yeah. see things that are on the track, like the cones that are out there mm -hmm. right now. Other sensors did you guys consider using? So, we've used... Uh, an IMU and an RTK. Uh, so GPS. an IMU being yeah. an inertial measurement unit, which is something that measures our uh, rate of turning and our accelerations in all in all our directions. And an RTK GPS, a GP, regular GPS, is only accurate to about one and a half meters. RTK allows us to be about centimeter accurate within uh, a certain range of a base station. So that allows us to localize very accurately, at least in, in theory, so as long as you have communication between. The so you use those in the past. We have we currently are using them on the cart. They are, okay. Yes. So I guess list all the sensors that you are using yeah. to form the autonomous control. For today for now, or for today? Um, yeah, today. Okay. Today. So the Belladine is the only sensor that is involved in the autonomous control currently. Currently, it's a completely reactive controller, which means that it does not remember what it did in the last frame. It looks only at the current state of the data and makes a decision for the current frame. Every twentieth of a second, Every it gets completely. Going in. Okay. Yes, so. so it has very, very bad short-term memory. And that worked well for you, that it model. Very well for okay. us. It has allowed us to run almost close to half of the RPM that is possible on this motor. Yes. Just purely reactive. Um, we're probably pushing the limit there when we're going to start. The go kart will start sliding instead of um, just rolling through the turns. So that's a good question. Do you guys have any learning? So we do not have any learning. No learning on yet. This, okay. This, this controller is purely tied to. A set of uh, predetermined parameters. So, so it's not given learned. given uh, localization, which is what we had previously yes. with the RTK GPS, uh, we would have been able to use a model, a mathematical model of the cart, which simplifies it down to uh, a simple a kinematic bicycle. Yes. So basically, it predicts a bunch of routes that would happen if I applied certain control inputs. Then we pick the one that gives us the most progress along the track. And then we apply, we run a, an optimizer to tell us which control inputs will actually make us run that closest to that trajectory that we're picking. 
So the reason that we have an issue with that is that our RTK GPS, we had issues with the communication with the base station, and that means the localization was jumpy. So we had big jumps, which would cause us to turn and have problems. So something to note is that when you have a localization system, it, that depends that heavily on it. When your model is more complicated, your data has to be better. Um, not So the reactive controller can actually deal with more noise in the data than our model can because the model is more sensitive to um, more parameters. So say the model has about 12 parameters we have to tune, this has about three. Yeah. So the dumber much, your controller, the more reliable it is. As in, in terms of uh, doing a single task, yes. right? Um, because this year we're not doing multi-cart, it is less important for us to have a uh, an ability to adjust on the fly. It's more important for us to have something that is tuned well for the trial. Yes. So in the future, this would be any kind of controller would be layered on top of this controller. So you'd have something reactive that allows you to explore with no data, and then you'd have something that's model predictive or uh, another learning, for example. Yeah. On top of that, that would compensate for behaviors that you don't want. So say there's another cart in your way and the planned path goes through it, that's not valid, so it will prevent you from running that path. Smart, very cool. Good theory, good strategy. Um, I All right, Tim, if you can just tell me, we've got the sensor reading and then how does it, the measurement get processed and then take action towards an autonomous control? So the sensor is hooked up to an ethernet cable on this side and it goes over a UDP, which is a, a networking protocol. And then on the other side is ROS, this is a robot operating system mm -hmm. that takes the information and turns it into uh, a point cloud, which is basically just a set of 3D points. Our stack takes that information and down samples it, which means that it takes all the points and basically makes, like, shrinks them into one. We then use a conversion from the Belladine points to a cost map, which is basically a 2D grid. And we take each point and we take a, uh, basically just a set of 3D points. Our stack takes that information and down samples it, which means that it takes all the points and basically makes, like, shrinks them into one. We then use a conversion from the, the Belladine points to a cost map, which is basically a 2D grid. And we take each point and we take a, uh, a structure, a morphology over it, which is basically a way to increase the size of the points without blurring the entire image. And then we run a blur over that, which causes us to get basically boundaries. So essentially we're turning the cones into quote unquote walls. And then the controller takes that these cones. Yes, these cones out here. Around the track. Yeah. So that turns them into boundaries. And once we have boundaries, we take there's two parts of the algorithm. There is the least cost. So we look at the cost of the cells being like how uh, how close are we to the cones? Or how close are we to the, the pseudo boundary? Alright, what were we talking about one more time? So we're talking about the boundary and how it determines what uh, control point to steer towards. So it looks at how close is it to the boundary by looking at the, the cells and it searches the cells for the least cost and then if the costs are the same it tries not to change steering so when we're going through a straight it's going to try not to change steering and it'll try and go in a straight line on whichever side of the track it happens to be on so that means that we produce and we produce a single point from that and then we use a pure pursuit controller so that basically means that i'm going to calculate the angle that i would like to be facing and then i steer towards it and then on the next frame, we do the exact same process every time. It takes the LiDAR data, it goes through that entire process again. It doesn't remember anything from the last frame and makes a new decision on a steering angle and that's adjusted. And that happens 20 times a second um, with very low latency because the LiDAR is built to stream these packets as fast as possible. So the, this system is uh, completely uh, self-contained to the time frame. Uh, as far as the computer goes... Yeah, tell me about the hardware. So. You told me about the, uh, the controls theory. Tell me about the hardware and what actual uh, tools you're using. Sure. So the tools we're using, so we're using ROS and the um, robot operating system allows us to create a subscriber publisher setup. So we can take the LiDAR data and we can push it out to a bunch of different stuff at the same time. Um, and it lets us all- uh, Where does ROS sit? What is it sitting on? on like physically, what hardware piece? It sits on top of the computer. 
inside the box. Was that your embedded board? No, this is, yeah, it sums on top of this um, this motherboard right here. So that mother, that's running Ubuntu. So like the regular- So this Ubuntu motherboard's running Ubuntu. And what'd you, where'd you get this board? We bought it from a place called GigaPC, which is, it's like a, it's an industrial board. It's built for um, putting in and like uh, automate, industrial automation cabinets. Okay. So, um, what are other options? I know NVIDIA has a pretty popular board. Yes, they have a Jetson. So the Jetson, yeah. The reason we went with this um, is because an Intel CPU and um, x86 is much easier to deal with as far as compiling for to start with. Um, in addition, most of our stuff is CPU bound, which means that it has to run on the central processing unit. Mm. And the Jetsons are optimized to run on for GPU intensive tasks. So graphics processing, so things like computer vision, that can take advantage of the GPU's ability to parallelize. Um, they run very well in the Jetson, but super CPU bound stuff, the Jetson does not have a very fast single threaded processor. And very so the process is single threaded, yeah. I think what you just said there, a lot of people on the internet are probably wondering, so that was phenomenal, thank you. Yeah. Um, so just to review, the Jetson would be better for computer vision. Computer vision uh, what you have here is better for the LiDAR. That kind of stuff. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and there, there is some, something to be said for, for optimizing for a, a platform like Jetson. Obviously, this takes a lot more power than a Jetson. The Jetson is, can be run as low as 10 watts. Um, even their more powerful one can be run as low as 10 watts. This will draw 100 watts, 100 we've watts tested, we've tested <laughs> under load, <laughs> which is, load. means that we have to have a much bigger battery for it and yeah. a much beefier power setup than you would if a Jetson with 30 watts. You can have a power converter that's that size easily. Um, and it would be completely encased. So. so back to it, you got the robot operating system on here. Um, you've got this board producing the logic. Mm -hmm. And then where does the logic go? The logic comes from, comes out this USB cable. Comes out this one right here. And so it goes into our low level controller. So the low level controller is what makes the determination of what goes to the- This guy right here. And what physically is that? That is a TNC uh, 3.5. Sorry, I'm not familiar with it. T-N-C? T-E-E-N-S-Y. T-E-E-N-S-Y. Think of it like an Arduino that grew up. It's in, it's a microcontroller, but it runs a lot faster than a... a it's grown up Arduino, it's still in the same clothes. But it's still in the same clothes. <laughs> so you can still program it through the Arduino RD, IDE. We, we don't. We use the straight C interface yeah. um, to program it but um, it allows us to very easily iterate on embedded systems. What is your communication between uh, this and this? Is it I squared C? It's serial for the- Serial, the straight serial? Straight, straight uh, like uh, UART essentially. Gotcha. Um, well, I don't know much, but I know that's not reliable, so. Nope, <laughs> nope, which is why the remote control is hooked up to the TNC instead of being hooked up to the computer. Okay. So um, the TNC makes that determination and then whatever gets into the actuators, um, the O drive that's in this box, is what controls the steering. So we send a signal over CAN to our motor controller, which is the O drive. So you do have CAN on here? Yeah. Okay, and yeah. so CAN is between your low level to your motor controller? To the, yes, to this, no, only to the steering and braking motor. Oh, okay, okay, so the low level to your uh, steering actuators and braking actuators. Yes, is that right? so the low level controller, the, the O drive essentially runs field oriented control for the process. DC. And the O drive is what you call your low level? The or? O drive is, uh, is a specific board actually. Oh, it's that another is, board, it's okay. another board, it's inside this box. It's inside this box. Yeah, so that board allows us to command a, a position for steering and a, a torque for braking. Nice. Which is very useful for so. running PID, it's very, it's, Correct me if I'm wrong, but let's review all the, the uh, boards you have on this. So you've got the sensor, and then you've got your um, your logic controller, mm -hmm. and then that outputs to your what you're calling the low-level yes. uh, Arduino on steroids, the Teensy, mm -hmm. and then that goes to your O-Drive, which controls the steering and the braking, mm -hmm. but then also, I'm guessing this simultaneously goes to the motor controller, which commands the torque. The only way to do the motor controller for us is through a zero to five volt signal. So oh yeah. Analog. Well, it's because you're using that guy. We're using this <laughs> one, right? So we had a lot of trouble with this actually. This There's a little practice in digital to analog conversion. Oh yes, definitely we have a DAC in there, but the issue we had is that there's no isolated ground for the throttle. So the throttle is on the same ground as the motor, which means the ground is very, we have a very unstable ground. Yeah, very and interesting. that caused us to have issues with the DAC locking up entirely. Yeah. It would not communicate with the TNC anymore. It caused our RPM sensor to go nuts and because it was on the same ground. Yes. <laughs> caused a few nightmares, hair loss. Nightmares. <laughs> so there's actually 
two layers of isolation in there. There's an isolation, there's an isolated I2C between that and the DAC. So yeah. There's an isolation layer between the TNC and the DAC. And then there is an isolation layer on the analog side of the DAC between the DAC and the motor controller. Let's also review your your, your communication. So you, you tell me, I don't, how does that communicate to that? I don't, I'm not really sure. The this, sensor to the... Uh, this is, uh, this one is UDP. This is runs on UDP, which is just a... Uh, Basically, it sends a bunch of packets over the network. Yes, so saying. then, you, yeah, because it's Ethernet. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So then, there you got here to here, you got UART, yeah. and then you got I squared C to the O drive, uh, it's, uh, can to the o or can drive. to the O drive. I squared C, I squared to, C the D to the DAC, and, and then the DAC device. obviously is analog, analog to, to the, the blue device. motor controller over here. Exactly. You guys just wanted to get practice and everything. Yeah, we're just well, running through all the electronics. electronics. Yeah, yeah. No, that's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it was it was probably more complicated than we would have preferred. Um, we tried to make it as simple as possible. We added complexity where we needed to. Where yeah. When we started. had an issue, um, we actually found our, our issue with our throttle. We were fine on the test stand. We would just sit there and run, and it was fine. And then we went to our, our dyno, and we put it on the thing, and it immediately locked up. It would go straight to the voltage, and it would stay there. And so when we put it under load, we had so much, the ground went from it's not that great to horrible. And... Uh, we had tons of issues, and it took us about four weeks to fix. To give you some reference, now. the ground plane was so um, was so unstable that the ground was messing up the ground for our RPM sensor. So it was literally causing incorrect RPM sensing, not because of radiative noise, but because of uh, common mode noise. Yeah, okay. So it's unstable. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, now, what you guys also just told me, there's more sensors than the LiDAR. You've got an RPM sensor. Yeah. Uh, what other sensors you guys have on here? So the RPM sensor allows us to do PID. The only other, that's the only other sensor that we have on here that allows us to run at a specific speed. Yes. Yeah. you talk about feedback BMS for the PC battery. Okay, unless you're talking <laughs> about, uh, okay, there's technically a BMS on the PC, on the PC. Oh, yeah. From destroying the PC battery. Yeah.